So, um, there's something coming up in the math department, which is having a, we're having colloquium tomorrow. So Professor Steve Robinson of Wake Forest will be talking in colloquium. He studies partial differential equations, so he's coming into town to talk to Professor Mavinga and Professor Morris. And while he's here, he's going to give us a colloquium. So he's going to talk about the game of hex, which is a pretty cool game. Is anyone willing to play the game of hex with me? OK, great. Would you come up? OK, so here's how it works. Someone is red and someone is blue. You have to be blue because my red is my favorite. And um, what? Yes, it works, although we're wearing the wrong colors. It's awkward. <laughs> So red's goal is to get from a hexagon on the red line to a hexagon on the blue line with some continuous path, con contiguous path, and blue is the same goal. So do you want to go first or second? Second. Okay, so I'll go first. Okay, this is my hexagon. Now you pick a hexagon. Nice. Love it. Uh-oh, looking bad for me. You haven't got, you need one more, oh yeah. Nice, nice job, yeah. So you have a continuous path that goes from the blue to the blue. Nice job, yeah, all right. Clap, good, 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 okay. Okay, so here's, here's a question you could ask. Like, you can, you can sit down if you want. So um, is it possible that we, this game could have ended with nobody winning? Like tic-tac-toe usually ends with nobody winning, yeah? So the question is, for this game, could it end with nobody winning? What do you think? Yeah. No, yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's no way for this game to end in nobody winning. Some, if you fill in these hexagons anyway with reds and blues, there's always a continuous path from either red to blue, or blue to red. And that's called the hex theorem. Um, and that's cute, right? It's cute that the game always has a solution. But amazingly, this hex theorem, the, the theorem that the game of x always has a winner, uh, you can use it to prove like big theorems in math. And that's what uh, Professor Robinson is going to talk about tomorrow. So pretty cool. And um, if he has time at the end, he's going to use it to prove one of his own theorems, which is pretty nice. Amazing, right? OK. So that's the, that's the story. All right. So I'm going to tell you the plan for the rest of the semester. So for the rest of the semester, we're going to integrate two types of things over two types of things. So we will integrate scalar-valued functions and vector-valued functions over curves and surfaces. So, um, so integrating a scalar valued function over a curve, that's what we'll do today. Here's how you can think about that. You have a curve, maybe it's like a wire. And on that wire, you have a scalar valued function. So that could be like the amount of charge at each point on the wire. So if you integrated a scalar valued function over a curve like that, you get the total charge on the wire. On the other hand, you could have a curve sitting in space, like maybe it's your clothesline, just like hanging outside from two trees, between two trees. And you have a vector, a vector function, a vector field, which is like wind blowing across your, your clothesline because you left your clothesline out in a hurricane. Why did you do that? But at least now you can calculate the stress on your clothesline. So that would be integrating a vector valued function over a curve. Or you could have a surface. So instead of having this wire or this clothesline in space, we could have a surface, like our um, sheet, like a bed sheet, right? You could have a scalar valued function over the bed sheet that was something like um, how much dirt there was per, per square inch on your, on your bed sheet because you left it outside and had a picnic on it. That would be integrating a scalar valued function over a surface. You imagine your bed sheet is curved. Or you could have a vector valued function over the surface, like you hang your, your bed sheet in the wind and it's, the wind is blowing through it and you could do the total amount of wind that was pressing on your bed sheet. That would be like a vector valued function over a surface. So this is our goal for the next four weeks, that's how much time we have left, is to integrate this over this, this over this, this over this, and this over this, whatever, the four, the four options. Um, and today we'll do scalar valued functions over curves. So that's today. And the next couple of days, 12 days, 11 days, we'll do the other things. Okay. Uh, but before we get into that, I'd like to do a bit of review because it's been some time since you probably thought about the things we talked about in the last 
lecture since there was an exam in between. Um, and so remember that we talked about divergence and curl. So you take divergence of a vector field and it gives you something. And you can also take the curl of a vector field and it gives you something. So the divergence was a measure of like how much stuff is created or destroyed at a different as a, at, a, at a given point. So can you say is the divergence a vector quantity or a scalar quantity? Scalar, scalar yeah, because it's the amount of something that's created or destroyed. So this is a scalar quantity. And then the curl of a vector field at any point, like you imagine your vector field is like some swirling wind, we're living in a snow globe. The curl of a vector field is the direction of the axis of rotation. Exactly, yeah, you put your fingers in the direction of the way it's turning and your thumb points in the direction of the curl at that point. How about this guy? Is it a scalar function or a vector function? Vector. It's a vector, yeah, because it, this, I'll, instead of calling this a scalar quantity, I'll call this a scalar function. Um, and this one is a vector function, because at any point it gives you a direction. Okay, so on your sheet, I've written a bunch of things, and I'd like you to tell me, uh, to you decide, you don't have to tell me, tell yourself, whether they make mathematical sense. So for instance, if you took the square root of a negative number, that would not make mathematical sense. Um, and in the same way, I wanted you to tell me if this divergence and curl things make mathematical sense, and then talk to your neighbor about it. Ready? Go. Okay, it looks like those of you who are thinking about it have finished thinking about it. So how about this first one? So the divergence of the curl of a vector field, does it make sense? Yeah, 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 I think so. Let's see. So the curl, uh, so a vector field is a vector quantity. The curl of a vector field, that gives you a vector function, fn function. And then we take the divergence of a vector function. Seems good. I agree. Good. OK. How about this one? Curl of divergence of f. Good or bad? No? No? Yeah, why not? Because the divergence of f is a uh, scalar. Yeah, the divergence of f gives you a scalar function. So, and then you're taking the curl of a scalar function. A scalar function doesn't have any rotation type deal at all. It's not, you can't really talk about that, it doesn't make sense. So this one doesn't make sense. Okay, how about the curl of the divergence of function f? No? Why not? Okay, so uh, this function f, so I, I, I uh, defined on the sheet that big F and big G were vector fields and little f was a, a function, a scalar function. So to take the divergence of a scalar function already doesn't make sense because this little function here is a scalar function. So this divergence of little function f uh, doesn't make sense in the beginning. So the middle doesn't make sense at all, so you can't take the curl of that for sure. So it's sort of wrong for two reasons. Okay, so the divergence of f dot g First of all, let's think about what it would mean to take the dot product of a vector field. So if you had a vector field like x comma y and another vector field like y comma x, then f dot g would just mean to take x dot x comma y dot y comma x. So it would be x times y plus y times x, which is 2xy. OK, so that's an example of what the kind of thing this would be. So, can you take the divergence of f dot g? No, why not? Yeah, it's a scalar. When you take the dot product of two vectors, you get a scalar function. So you can't take the divergence of a scalar function, doesn't make sense. Okay, how about the curl of the gradient of f? Yeah, yeah, the gradient of f um, is a vector function. And then the curl of a vector function Sure, makes sense. And how about the divergence of the gradient of f? Yeah, also good. The gradient of f is still a vector function. 
So taking the divergence of a vector function, good, makes sense. Yeah. So um, these were fun to play with. That was the idea. But two of them are important. So one of them is the divergence of the curl. And the other one is the curl of a gradient vector field. That's what we call it when your vector field is the gradient of some function. So we'll, we'll talk about these a bit more. OK. Goodbye, Hex. See you tomorrow afternoon. OK, so let's compute these things. So let's do curl of gradient of f first. So curl of gradient of f. OK, so then we have to remember what the gradient of f is. The gradient of f is a vector function consider consisting of derivative with respect to x, derivative with respect to y, derivative with respect to z, if it's a three, va three, ve three variable function. So this would be like fx, fy, fz. OK, we want to find the curl of that thing. So to compute the curl, we have to do this cross product thing, the cross product of the vector field, this gradient vector, with our, our operator that takes partial derivatives. So we have i, j, k, those are vectors across the top, partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y, partial with respect to z, and then our fx, fy, fz. OK, we have to compute this. Let's do it. So I'll start here on the left, because I know it's going to be quite long. So the first component, the i component, I cover up these, and I take partial with respect to y of fz. So that's like fz, partial with respect to z of f, and then I take the partial with respect to y. So that we call that fzy. OK, that's the first part. Minus partial with respect to z of fy. So that's fy, and then partial with respect to z. Yeah, that's OK. So I took. So partial with respect to y of fz minus partial with respect to z of fy. OK, that's the first component. Then the middle turns the opposite of partial with respect to x of fz, so fzx minus partial with respect to z of fx, so fxz. And then the last one, the last part is partial with respect to x of fy, so fyx minus partial with respect to y of fx, so fxy. Yeah. Question? Um, no, I was figuring out that if, when you're doing like a cross product of that operator, yeah. times one of those, it's basically just uh, adding uh, extra derivative to it. Yeah, when you take the uh, cross product of this derivative operator, it's like adding another derivative or taking another derivative. Exactly. Yeah. OK, now these look awfully similar, fzy and fyz. Um, we, we showed, or we, we know, uh, by Clairaut's theorem, that as long as our function is nice in all the ways that we usually have, um, these two things are equal. Right? It doesn't matter what order you take the partial derivatives. So by Clairaut's theorem, like f, x i x j equals f x j x i. All I mean by that is that you can switch the order in which you take derivatives with respect to one of the variables. This could be x y y x z x x z, and so on. So, so um, the curl of the gradient of f is this component is zero. This component is zero. This component is zero. So it's just zero. Yay! Yeah, right. Ta-da! Thank you. OK, so that was a nice little bit of algebra. And now we might want to think about what it means. OK, we're saying that if you have a gradient vector field, it never has curl anywhere. So you think about what that would mean. So, um, so if um, the vector field f has curl, or non-zero curl, at some point p, then it looks like, so here's p somewhere. And then around it, um, things are, curve, are curling around. They're, they're moving in a circle. I'll move my p because it's not in the middle. So if the curl is non-zero, 
it means that something's rotating. It might be rotating counterclockwise, which is what I drew, or it might be rotating clockwise. So that's what curl looks like, rotation of some, of some nature. Now suppose that f is a gradient vector field. The gradient, the gradient vector points in the direction where you increase. So what this would mean is, if you suppose you start here, here you are, and uh, you walk, you say, oh, I want to increase. Walk this way 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 to increase. Then you get back to where you started, and your function value would be increasing the whole time. So that would mean that you get back to where you started, and you would have gone up. So that now you're higher than you were before. So that doesn't make any sense. If you, may, if you just walk around a mountain and you get back to where you started, you should have the same elevation you did before. So this does not make any sense. So this, so um, uh, for a gradient vector field, um, it's impossible to have curl because it would imply you can go in a circle and end up at a different function value. OK, so that would not make sense. So if you have a gradient vector field, it basically tells you the way that the, the rain goes when the rain falls down after on the mountainscape, and the rain never goes in a circle. Always goes down, downhill. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The other one we should compute is divergence of the curl of f. So So this is the divergence of let's suppose that f is this f here is p q r then we compute the curl of f by doing something like this and uh, we, I'll just write down what we get. So this is the divergence of the curl of f. The curl of f is ry minus qz comma pz minus rx comma qx minus py. So that's the thing I said you didn't have to remember because you could always get it by doing the cross product. Uh, but since it's useful to have it in this form, I'm just going to write it down from here. Now the divergence is partial with respect to x of the first component plus partial with respect to y of the second component plus partial with respect to z of the third component. So let's do it. So this is r, y, and then x minus q, z, and then x plus p, z, and then y minus r, x, and then y plus q, x, and then z minus p, y, and then z. OK, a bunch of partial derivatives. I w Gosh, that's awful looking. Does it work? Does anything cancel out? Yes. Good. OK. So let's see. Ryx and negative Rxy. By Clairaut's theorem, those are equal and opposite. So we can cancel those out. Qzx and Qxz. Here's a positive. Here's a negative. By Clairaut's theorem, equal and opposite plus pzy minus pyz by Clairaut's theorem equal and opposite. So this equals 0. So it tells you that the divergence of the curl of a vector field is always 0. So both of these theorems, both of these results, said that the answer was 0. Over here, by the way, it's a 0 vector, because it's a curl thing. Over here, it's a 0 number, it's a divergence thing. So I explained why the curl of a vector field can't exists, so it has to always be 0 because it wouldn't make sense. Um, this one, I think, is a bit more difficult to think about geometrically. You have some, but let's think about what it would mean. You have some vector field, which you can think of as how the wind is swirling around in our snow globe of a room. And at every point, you compute the curl, which is the axis of rotation of the snow. And it's saying that there's never any places where like, all the arrows are pointing out. That would be positive divergence. Because how would it be? Yeah, it kind of geometrically doesn't make sense that it could cur swirl in all those ways, like all pointing out from a certain point. And that's what it's saying. 
is that you can't have that happen. Yeah. Okay, so the takeaway message is that uh, the curl, oops, curl of the gr a gradient vector field is always zero, and the divergence of the curl of any vector field is always zero. And we proved this using Clairaut's theorem in both cases. Okay, this was by Clairaut's theorem. Again. All right, yeah, questions or ideas? Does theorem not work? So when does Clairaut's theorem not work? Uh, you have to carefully construct a very ugly function for it to not work. Um, I do not remember an example off the top of my head. But a non-differentiable function, I believe. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay, so let's talk about scalar line integrals. So for scalar line integrals, Um, are for integrating um, a function over a curve. So um, when you think about integrating over a curve, I encourage you to think about this as like a wire. So you have a wire, and you're integrating a function over it, and the function is something like the charge, the charge density at each point of the wire. So when you integrate that, you get the total charge on the wire. Or if you think about it as um, a curve is like the path, the path from here to the dining hall, and you are very hungry, and it is very snowy outside because there's been a big snowstorm, and some places the snow is low, and some places the snow is high, and here you are with your shovel, and you're gonna shovel the whole path from here to the dining hall, which is not straight, it curves. You wanna know what's the total amount of snow. So you're like accumulating the total amount of snow over the path. So that would be what you're doing. Um, I do not like the term scalar line integrals because a line is a straight line. But these are integrating over curves. Not every curve is a straight line. Some curves are curved, right? And so you should remember that the scalar line integrals are over curves. So for instance, every time I make, um, I make figures using a program called Keynote, and if you want to add a curve to your picture, you go insert, line, curved line. And I don't like that at all. It's like, what kind of line do you want? I want a, a curved line. That's not a line, it's just not a line. So anyway, it's easier to just copy paste a curve from your previous picture and then change it than to create a new curved line because that's just so awkward. Okay, so these are scalar curve integrals which are called line integrals. So here's the idea. Um, so the idea is that in the plane you have some curve, so this might be your path from here uh, in room science center over to here um, in room Sharples. And um, on each, at each point, there's some function, which is you can think of as like density of snow or height of snow. So the function value gives a different value to each point, And then it's some nice uh, smooth thing maybe there, okay. And so let's put this in space so that we can see it better. So there's the x-axis and the y-axis and the z-axis and this f of x, y gives the height of the snow or the value of the function at every point and this is your curve C. And so we would say given a function f of x, y and a curve C in the x, y plane Uh, with parametric equations describing it, the parametric equation for the curve is like r of t. So at any point, at any time t, r of t tells you where you are um, from with parametric equation r of t from t equals a to t equals b. So here you are in the science center at time t equals a, and there you will be at the dining hall 
at time t equals b. Um, the scalar line integral of f over c is, so the notation of it is this, the scalar line integral over c of f ds, and little s, and that means at every point on your curve c, you find the function value f, and then you multiply by the tiny little increment of distance along the curve ds. And the way we compute this, this is the, the meat of this, is you go from t equals a to t equals b of f of r of t. So at any point r of t, you say, what's my function value at this point? What's my function value at this point? And then you multiply by um, r prime of t, the magnitude of r prime of t, dt. So here's what's going on. Um, this f of r of t is like the height of the function at time t. So whatever, wherever you are, time t, you figure out how high the function is at time t. And then r prime of t is how fast you're going at time t. Because r of t is your position, and so r prime of t is your velocity. So this is your speed. And then you have speed times time. Rate right times time, distance. So this is um, like the uh, tiny arc length. So what you're doing is, you're saying, what's my function value? And then what's my little arc length? So you're making a little Riemann sum. So then at the next point, what's my function value? What's my arc length? I'm making another little box. So this is adding up the areas of all those little boxes. And then when you make your time increment very, very small, just a little tiny dt, you get the area of your um, fence or a piece of snow or, in general, the scalar line integral of the function over the curve. Yeah. Yeah, questions or ideas? OK, let's do it. So let's do an example. So, uh, so example. So compute the scalar line integral of f of x equals 8x over the curve c consisting of the part of the parabola y equals x squared from x equals 1 to x equals 2. OK, that's the goal. Let's draw a picture. So uh, here's the x-axis. Here's the y-axis. And then here's the parabola coming through. OK, so there it is, y equals x squared. And now we want the part from x equals 1. So I guess that's the point 1, 1, all the way over to the point where x equals 2. So that's the point 2, comma 4. So this part is our curve C. And then we want to integrate the function 8x over it. So at the beginning, the, uh, 8x x is 1, so the height is 8. And at the end, x is 2, so the height is 16. So it looks something like this. So I had originally drawn it as getting higher and higher. But in the, in the last class, somebody pointed out that since x isn't growing that fast, this is actually growing slower and slower as you go along. So it should be curved down. Kind of cute. So we want to know the total area of this thing, which is 
the line integral over C of F of, well, 8x really, ds, small s. So that's what we'll want. So let's try to do it. OK, so we'll need a couple of things. So the first thing we need is we need parametric equations for C. OK, so we know that our curve is y equals x squared. And we somehow need like x equals some function of t comma y equals some function of t. So r of t is um, x of t, y of t. And we want this to trace out y equals x squared. So if you're trying to come up with parametric equations for something, you can do it however you like. Um, but one trick is to call one of the variables t and then solve for the other one in terms of that variable. So if we were to call x t, then we know that y is x squared, so y is t squared. OK. We could have also done um, square root of t comma t. It would have worked OK, since uh, they're both positive in the first quadrant. So that would have worked too. OK? Or any other thing you could have think of that would, be, that would chase out that curve. So now we're going to need, in order to compute this, we're going to need the, the size of the velocity vector, so that speed. So we'll need this magnitude of r prime of t. So let's compute um, r of t, first of all, r prime of t. So here's r of t, and we just need r prime of t, which is a term by term derivative. So derivative of t with respect to t is 1. And the derivative of t squared with respect to t is 2t. OK? So this magnitude of r prime of t, then, is the square root of this squared plus this squared. So 1 squared plus 2t quantity squared. So that's square root of 1 plus 4t squared. OK, great. I think we have all the ingredients now. So let's write the integral. So we want the integral, this scalar line integral of over C of f ds is the integral from t equals a to t equals b. Uh-oh, I forgot to fill that in. OK, so r of t is t comma t squared. And we want t, yeah, which values of t do we want? Yeah, 1 to 2, because we want the part where x equals 1 to x equals 2. And x is t. So we want t to go from 1 to 2. OK, fine. OK, so t goes from 1 to 2. Now we want f of r of t. So f of x is 8x. I'll highlight that. f of x is 8x. And x is t. So f of x, comma y, is just 8t. So here, this is our f of x comma y. And now we want to multiply by the speed. And our speed is square root of 1 plus 4t squared. So this part here is our speed, magnitude of x prime of t. And then times dt. OK. So there's our integral. So if we are able to compute this, it will give us the area of this fence. OK, let's do it. So we want to take the antiderivative of this function. And we are so lucky. It's usually, it's very hard actually to integrate, under, to integrate square roots with functions inside. But today, the derivative of the inside appears on the outside. Yes. So it should be like 1 plus 4t squared Let's see, the square root is to the 1 half power. So we add 1. 1 half plus 1 is 3 halves. I think that's right. Oh, we have to maybe adjust on the front with the 2 thirds. Because then when we take the derivative, let's check that the derivative of this thing is the integrand. When we take the derivative, we'll multiply 3 halves by 2 thirds. It'll go away. Get a 1 on the front. That's what we want. Times this thing to the 1 half power. That's the square root. Times the derivative of the inside, which is 8t. So it seems to work. OK. And we'll go from t equals 1 to t equals 2. OK. 
so one thing I forgot to do before we started was to try to estimate what the answer should be. So I want to know what approximately I should get for an answer. So I was thinking, like, just the distance, the, the length of this curve, the y values go from 1 to 4. So it's at least a different distance of 3 long. So this length, this length is a bit more than 3. And then how about the heights of these? At the beginning, it starts at 8 and it ends at 16. So the heights is about 12. The average of 8 and 16 is 12. So I'm expecting an answer of about 3 times 12, 36. Maybe a little more than 36. OK, so we expect about 3 times 12, which is 36. OK, let's see what we get. So when we plug this in, we get 2 thirds times, OK, we plug in t equals 2. 2 squared is 4. 4 times 4 is 16 plus 1 is 17. OK, 17 to the 3 halves power minus, when t equals 1, it's 1 plus 4, which is 5. 5 to the 3 halves power. There, that number. And I computed this on a calculator, and I got that it's about 39. So it works. OK. OK, so the idea there was that in order to compute a scalar line integral, the first thing you need to do is define your curve parametrically. Because that's the only way that uh, we can do curves, because we have to say how it moves in time. Um, and then you also have to find the speed that the particle is going at any time. And then once you have those things, you can put them together. And then you just have to integrate. And often you can't actually find the antiderivative if it's a sort of a square root thing. But the, for the ones that you'll have, you'll be able to do them. Yeah, questions or ideas? Okay, so another thing that we are able to integrate is uh, spirals, or helixes, or helices, however you want to call them. Okay, so, so consider the uh, spring. There are two turns of the spring defined by r of t is cos t sine t t. And we want turns, two turns of the wire. So for t between 0 and 4 pi. So this looks like two turns of this wire. So it goes around once and then around twice. Um, we have seen this kind of thing before. Cos t sine t means that it's going around in a circle. And the z component t, t means that it's going up. So we start here at t equals 0. And we end up here at t equals 4 pi. And in the middle, we're here at t equals 2 pi. Um, suppose the charge at some point x, y, z is f of x, y, z equals z. And I imagine that there's like some positively charged thing up here at the top. So it's attracting all the negative charge. So um, in the bad tradition of pretending that you can see electrons, I'll say that there's no electrons at the bottom. And then here, there's more electrons. And then there get more and more and more and more and more. And at the top, there's just lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of electrons. So there, the electrons on the curve look like that, if you could see them. They're, so they're most dense at the top, half is dense in the middle, and then there's no electrons at the bottom. Zero charge, whatever. OK, so find the total charge of the spring. Or it could just be a, a coiled wire. OK, so part one, parametric equations for the curve, done. Given, OK, um, find, second thing is to find the speed at any time. So let's find first just r prime of t. So r of t is cos t sine t t. So the derivative of cos t is negative sine t 
The derivative of sine t is cos t. And the derivative of t is 1. Good? So that's our velocity vector at any point. And now we want to find its magnitude. So that's the square root of the first thing squared plus the second thing squared plus the third thing squared. So negative sine t squared plus cos t squared plus 1. Sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. So this is the square root of 1 plus 1, which is the square root of 2. OK, so now we know this thing is going at a constant speed the whole time. Constant speed of square root of 2. Good to know. OK, and now we'll set up the integral and compute. Or write down the integral. So the scalar line integral over c of f ds is the integral from t equals whatever at the beginning to t equals whatever at the end. So I guess that's 0 to 4 pi of f of x, y, z. So f of x, y, z is z. And z is t. So our integrand is just t times our speed. So times square root of 2 and then dt. So that's it. So now we just integrate this. So this is t squared over 2 times root 2 from t equals 0 to t equals 4 pi. So this is 4 pi quantity squared root 2 over 2. Or let's see, this is 16 pi squared. 16 over 2 is 8. So 8 pi squared root 2. So apparently, the total amount of charge is 8 pi squared times the square root of 2. OK. Um, it's kind of hard to tell if this is reasonable. I mean, you could say, I know the amount of charge here in the middle is 2 pi. So maybe the average amount of charge is 2 pi. And I could multiply that by the length of the coil to see if that kind of makes sense. But I don't have the length of the coil. So let's do that. Find the length. So this is an ap okay, application of this sort of thing. So to find the length of a curve, C, you just compute the line integral over C of the function 1 ds. Um, so this goes along with things that we've, been, that we've seen before, that if you integrate the function 1 over a region of the plane, you get its area. If you integrate the function 1 over a solid, you get its volume. And now, dropping down a dimension to dimension 1, if you integrate 1 over a curve, you get its length. So this is length of c. So for our example, we take the line integral from t equals 0 to t equals 4 pi of the function 1 times the speed Let's see, we already figured out that the speed was square root of 2 dt. So that's square root of 2. If we integrate square root of 2, we get square root of 2t from t equals 0 to t equals 4 pi. So we get 4 pi square root of 2. That's how long the helix is. Now we know. And it kind of makes sense because if you just had a circle going around twice, going around once, circle of radius 1 is circumference 2 pi, go around again, you get the circumference to be 4 pi. But that's not what we do. We go around twice and we go up. So it's 4 pi length times a stretching factor of root 2. So length, so there's the length of our thing. So if we take the length times the average charge, so the length is 4 pi root 2. And this average charge here was 2 pi. It's, it's not really an average, it's just the charge at, at the middle point, because that's like a reasonable place to start. You would get, what, 8 pi squared root 2, which is what we got. So, so our answer seems reasonable. Now we can go over here and conclude that answer seems reasonable. Okay. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that I put at the bottom of the sheet um, and if we suppose that the charge at any point was instead x times z. 
then we, when we uh, computed our function, instead of our function just being t, it would be x, which is cos t. So it would be cos t, uh oh, cos t times t times root 2. And if you integrated this, you'd have to do integration by parts. Um, so that is probably the first thing you learn to integrate by parts. Um, and it would come up here. Yeah, questions or ideas? All right, thank you.